vCenter server heartbeat installation and validation. This KBTV video demonstrates how to install, configure, and validate vCenter server heartbeat, including failover and switchover. This video is based on VMware support training, best practices, and the vCenter server heartbeat documentation found at pubs.vmware.com. We'll start with an introduction to our existing environment, where we have vCenter 5.1 running in a vCloud virtual machine that is managing a number of hosts and running virtual machines. There have been no changes or preparations for vCenter server heartbeat installation yet. We will be installing vCenter server heartbeat in an environment where both vCenter nodes will be on the same IP subnet and is therefore considered a LAN deployment. If the vCenter server nodes are to be on different IP subnets, such as for disaster recovery purposes, then it is considered a WAN deployment. Currently, the vCenter hostname is simply vCenter with an IP address of 10.0.0.10 using a single virtual network adapter. All clients, hosts, and plugins communicate with vCenter using this hostname and will continue to do so after vCenter server heartbeat is installed and running. VMware recommends using a multi-NIC configuration, which is easily configured in a virtual environment. To get started with vCenter Server Heartbeat, we'll need to take a look at the pre-install requirements as per the documentation. In this video, we are using a Windows 2008 virtual-to-virtual -virtual deployment. As shown here, we will need to plan for a separate network for the VMware channel. The current vCenter IP address will become the principal public network address, and we will also need to plan for two new IP addresses for management to ensure that the vCenter nodes are consistently network accessible for purposes such as time synchronization, anti-malware definition updates, and Active Directory synchronization. Make sure your environment is supported as per this part of the documentation. For this environment, vCenter is joined to the domain vmware.com. No other business critical applications are installed. All components are configured to connect by fully qualified domain name. Using Update Manager as an example, here is where this setting can be verified. Two gigabytes of extra RAM has been added to this vCenter. There is plenty of free space on the vCenter C drive. We are logged in as a local administrator. Latest Microsoft security updates are installed. All applications to be protected are already installed. We do not yet have a secondary server where we can check the date, time, and time zone because this is a fresh deployment. The managed IP setting for the current vCenter is already set to the principal IP address. You can confirm the setting through the vSphere client as shown here. We can ignore this item because Windows Server Backup tools are not required in a virtual-to-virtual -virtual configuration. All vCenter services are set to automatic right now as per the default install. In the next step, we will set the IP addresses on the primary server. The secondary server does not yet exist because this is a fresh deployment. And finally, there are no firewalls in this environment. In a virtual-to-virtual -virtual deployment with multiple NICs, VMware recommends that each virtual NIC be on a separate virtual switch to ensure dedicated bandwidth. The hosts in this environment have a few unused NICs, and we have set up a dedicated VLAN for these to communicate through, so we are creating a new virtual switch for these now. In preparation for the next step, we will add the second virtual network adapter to the VM and connect it to the dedicated Heartbeat Channel network. Please note that all of the following steps throughout the video are referenced from the documentation. For any further details on steps performed here, please see the documentation for the version of the product that you are implementing. As of right now in this active environment, this is how the name and IP address are configured for this vCenter. Once installation is complete, the environment will be configured as shown. The vCenter hostname and IP address becomes the principal IP address that will move to whichever node is active. The vCenter machine will be renamed as part of the install process, and a permanent static management IP address will be assigned. The channel connections are on a dedicated, isolated network with no DNS or gateway. Notice that IP addresses are adjacent, and that as a string, the starting digits of one IP address cannot be a match for another. For example, if the principal address was 10.0.0.2, then all these digits would match the first digits of both management IP addresses, and it would be possible that the wrong IP address is released during a switchover. These new names must be manually added to DNS, as shown here. Notice that there are no DNS entries for the channel IP addresses, and there are no changes to the existing vCenter name. We can now begin the installation process, starting with making necessary networking changes on the primary node. Make sure that the network adapters are named appropriately, and start with the advanced IP settings for the VMware channel network. Set the IP address as planned, and clear the register this connection's address in DNS checkbox, because this connection's only purpose is for communication to the other node. For the principal connection, 
add the new management IP address as shown so that the adapter holds both. Clear the register this connection's address and DNS checkbox so that there are no unintentional automatic changes and disable NetBIOS over TCP IP. We are now ready to clone the vCenter VM, which can even be done hot with the VM powered on. Ensure that the new VM is not powered on. Rename the VMs in inventory to identify their new identities and create a DRS anti-affinity rule to ensure that the VMs run on separate hosts. The last preparation is to create a network share that can be accessed later by the secondary server through the VMware channel network. One of the steps in the installer is to save configuration files to this path, but the secondary will not be on the principal network yet when it needs these files. Since our VMware channel network is isolated, we will create a share on the primary node and remove it later. Now we can run the vCenter server heartbeat installer on the primary node. During the installation, the vCenter server is up and running, but clients should be ready for downtime as a reboot will be required. Remember that this is the primary node currently running the vCenter server. Be sure to carefully read the license agreement before continuing. I personally have it memorized. Without a serial number, vCenter server heartbeat will be in evaluation mode. One license key allows you to protect any service that is connecting to the vCenter server instance. This includes SSO, inventory service, support tools, web client, and SQL server, even if these services are installed on a different machine with vCenter server heartbeat protection. As long as all components are for this licensed vCenter server heartbeat instance, then only one license key is required. Since both nodes will be in the same network subnet, this is a LAN deployment, and the secondary server is virtual. We will accept the default install location and include the desktop icons. Select the network adapter and IP address that was set up for the VMware channel and type in the address planned for the secondary node's VMware channel. Now identify the principal network adapter and IP address. This is the same address that has been in use for the existing vCenter. In a LAN configuration, this IP address is shared with both nodes, so there is no principal IP address to configure for the secondary node. Select the management IP address for the primary node and specify the address for the secondary node. Click no on this warning message because we have intentionally left the secondary node powered off as per the documentation. In this step, we specify the new management names for the primary and secondary nodes. Note that the names are not entered as fully qualified domain names. The installer now automatically detects the components installed on this local machine, so confirm that nothing is missing. This is correct for our vCenter server 5.1 with SQL server on the same system. The login credentials are for an administrator account on the vCenter server to register the vCenter server heartbeat plugin. Now provide the UNC share path that will be accessible by the secondary VMware channel network. Verify that the configuration is correct before continuing. The report shown is just a warning regarding SQL server's run as account and can be ignored. In this step, the packet filter is installed and the VMware channel is configured. Active connections to the vCenter server may be interrupted at this point. When the primary installation is complete, perform a final DNS verification for the principal and management names to be sure that the IP addresses are correct. Once finish is clicked, the server will attempt to rename itself. If the current credentials do not have permission to rename the machine in Active Directory, a login prompt will appear. It is also advised to unhide the heartbeat tray icon to be able to easily identify the server identities and status later. Once the reboot is complete, the final step is to refresh the single sign-on server. Log on to the primary node and open an elevated command prompt. Navigate to the path C, Program Files, VMware, Infrastructure, SSO Server, Utils, and run the RSA util command as shown with your SSO server's master password. We have blocked out our super secret SSO master password for this video. Next, restart the SSO server service, then restart the vCenter server service. You may notice that the tray icon displays application warnings while the protected services restart. The primary node is now complete, and this is how the networking is currently configured. It may take some time for the primary node to start all its services back up. Once it is back online, log into the vSphere client, disconnect the secondary VM from all networking to avoid conflicts later, and power it on.
plug into the server and note that the name is still vCenter from when this was cloned before the primary installation. We perform the same steps as we did on the primary node. Verify which MAC address connects to which network to ensure correct connection. Starting with the VMware channel connection, set up the secondary IP address. Note that once again we do not specify a gateway or DNS. On the DNS tab, uncheck the box for register this connection's address in DNS. And in the WINS tab, select Disable NetBIOS over TCP IP. For the principal adapter, make sure to add the management IP address like any other machine on the network, and add the principal IP address. During the installation, the packet filter will make sure that there isn't a conflict. Uncheck the box for register this connection's address in DNS. It is now safe to connect the VMware channel. Make sure both checkboxes are on, or else the virtual network adapter will not be connected when the VM powers on again. Run the Heartbeat installer on the secondary node. The installer was already on the primary before we cloned it. Select secondary for the server identity, and now enter the share path using the primary VMware channel IP address. This warning message is again related to SQL Server's run as account and can be ignored. Once the packet filter is installed, we then connect the principal adapter to the network. Again, be sure that both checkboxes are on so the virtual adapter will be connected when the VM powers on in the future. We confirm that the adapter connected in the guest and continue the installation. Identify the adapter to be used for the principal IP address. We do not have to configure any IP addresses because this was already done during the primary install. When complete, the secondary will attempt to rename and restart. We need to enter credentials with permissions to add a machine to the domain because this is the first time this clone has been able to contact the domain controller and its login token is no longer valid. While we're waiting for the secondary to reboot, the shared directory on the primary node can now be unshared and deleted. This is how the network is configured at this point. Once the secondary has rebooted, confirm that the machine name changed and is still a domain member. Open a command prompt and verify that DNS is still correct. These IP addresses are exactly as expected. Don't forget to unhide the vCenter server heartbeat tray icon as well, currently indicating that this is the secondary and is passive. Now that the installation is complete for both nodes, it's time to log into the vCenter Server Heartbeat console and take a look. Back on the primary node, double-click the Manage Server icon, click the plus button and connect to localhost. From here we can see that the secondary is running and replication has been working successfully, but there are some warnings to resolve to complete the installation. Go to Applications and then Plugins, select the Virtual Center plugin and click Edit. Enter an account with access to the vCenter. This only needs to be configured once because vCenter server heartbeat configuration changes will take effect for both nodes. For best protection of SQL Server, VMware recommends configuring its service to run as a local administrator account. This needs to be done manually for the SQL Server service on each node. The change will take effect when we perform a switchover. Next, we configure the set SPN task to use a local administrator account. Click the User Accounts button and provide credentials for an administrator. Wait a moment for the account to be validated and edit both of the set SPN tasks to switch the run as account from local system to the admin account. We can now validate that the vCenter server heartbeat pair is functioning correctly by simulating a failure, confirming the state of the pair and running services, and then manually switching back. These steps are found in Appendix C of the installation documentation. These exercises are examples and should be performed in this order. VMware recommends against attempting to test failover on a properly operating pair by methods such as unplugging a power cord or hard powering off the virtual machine. At the moment that power is lost, any data not written to the passive server is lost. VMware recommends that all actions intended to verify operation of the passive server be performed as a switchover rather than a failover. Please note that graceful shutdowns of the guest operating system are not considered a valid test. An executable is installed with vCenter Server Heartbeat that can emulate a failure and is recommended for safe testing. In the first part of the validation, we will emulate a failure on the primary and monitor Heartbeat from the secondary. We haven't set up the Heartbeat console connection on the secondary yet, so we will do that now. Before starting the validation procedure, check that the following is true. The primary node is active and synchronized with the secondary, as shown here. All protected services are working normally, which we have confirmed through various operations on the vSphere web client as shown previously, 
And finally, confirm that a failover will occur when channel heartbeats are lost. On a LAN deployment, this is on by default. When ready, navigate to the vCenter server heartbeat bin directory on the primary node and execute nfavt.exe to emulate a failure. We can watch the process from the console on the secondary server. While applications are being started, we can see further details by refreshing the system services periodically. We can see here that so far most services have already been started and a few others are still in progress. Once complete, we see this. The primary is dead and the secondary is active but is not replicating since the primary is unavailable, but the applications are started as expected. The next part is to confirm the current state of both nodes and the active vCenter. This is the first time vCenter is running on a different system and now the IP addresses look like this. The principal address is now owned by the secondary node. When clients try to connect, connections should transparently be served by the secondary node now. Let's log into the web client and see. We can see that the hosts are all connected and the inventory is correct. We will create a test VM to see if it is still in inventory when we switch back to the primary later. Taking a look back at system services on the primary node and after clicking the refresh button, we see that the protected applications are no longer running and the system tray displays dash dash as expected. We now start vCenter server heartbeat on the primary. This may take a moment, but the vCenter server heartbeat console will reconnect on its own. Confirm that a connection has been established between the pair. The pair will synchronize automatically and then the active secondary will start replicating data back to the passive primary. The secondary node remains active. Now select the data page and wait for the file system and registry to synchronize. Since the primary failed, a full system check is required and can take some time. In a controlled switchover, this synchronization does not take very long. Now that synchronization is complete, the vCenter server heartbeat pair is ready for the final part of the verification process. Once again, verify the status of each node first. Select the primary node and click Make Active. This is called a manual switchover. Once the switchover is complete, we can see everything was successful and we confirm that everything is synchronized on the data page. We can log back into the vCenter server again and confirm that our hosts are all connected and the test VM we created while the secondary was active is still in inventory as expected. The installation was a success and validation is now complete. We hope you enjoyed this KBTV video.